Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm Seema Kumar. I'm uh, Rishi's wife and uh, we are going to kick off this event today. Um, I'm, I want to introduce you to Lisa Wade, who is our anchor for this afternoon. Uh, Lisa is a member of the Santa Clara County Activists for Animals and she is, has been helping us out uh, running many of these seminars that we have been able to bring to Saratoga. Um, Lisa, uh, we also have to thank Lisa for all the food that's in the back. Uh, she was able to get us a lot of food uh, this afternoon. So um, thank, thank you, Lisa, and please uh, come on over. Thank you, Seema. And um, I'm here to introduce Rishi Kumar. I'm so happy to introduce Rishi, who has initiated this Saratoga seminar series for our community. Rishi and I collaborated a few months ago on the Cowspiracy documentary screening. Rishi believes in creating a sustainable future for the future generation, and building environmental consciousness is part of his agenda. Rishi works full-time in the Silicon Valley high-tech industry as a senior executive during the day, and he also happens to be Saratoga City Council member. Community service is his passion. As Saratoga's community organizer, Rishi is host of many community events in Saratoga, many of which are free, like the event today, and always inclusive, usually addressing a need or social cause. Community events that create learning, intermingling, opportunities for youth, health, wellness, spiritual living, cultural celebrations, Sunday classes, such as meditation, yoga, coders club, Lego robotics club, and yoga. Community outreach and progressive engagement is a focus for him as a community leader. Let us please welcome Rishi Kumar to kick this off. Thank you so much, Lisa, uh, and appreciate everything you did to make this event happen, really appreciate it. Lots of great food, we will enjoy it between uh, our two presenters, between presenter one and two. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons why we do this is because we are really trying to ensure that the vegetation we plant in Saratoga is a little bit conducive to our environment. You know, create that environmental consciousness, is how I would call it, and build the sustainable future. So when you look at, uh, for example, uh, currently California, in spite of all this rain, we are still under drought. Our snowpack is uh, at about 80%. We have still not hit our 100% yet in the Sierras. And that's a really good gauge in terms of how we are doing with our drought. When you look at uh, the state of California, 37% of California is still under drought. Before we hit all these rains, 87% of California was under drought. So it's still a huge challenge for us. You know, water is a huge challenge for us. And so there are certain best practices that we could adopt to, to help build a sustainable future for California. You know, when you look at California, much of the Midwest, you have Utah also in a state of drought, Texas was in a state of drought, and then they had this huge uh, flooding that happened in Texas, right? So we might, uh, we are going through an El Nino effect right now, but we are going to fall short, is what we have been told. You know, the El Nino is not playing out to expectations. And what follows after the El Nino is the La Nina. You know, it's, it's not a song, it's not a, <laughs> but it's actually the, the drought, uh, the, uh, once again, in drought, we will have a shortfall of rain next year. So it's a recurring pattern. You know? I mean, this, this drought has been uh, ongoing for many, many years now. And so how do we address that? And uh, some of the things that we did in our city is, for example, uh, when you look at Santa Clara Valley Water District, they have rolled out lots of rebate programs to help our citizens. Low flow uh, valves that we can put inside our home. Uh, turning that uh, green grass in the front into drought-tolerant vegetation. So those are some ideas that uh, the Santa Clara Valley Water District and the city of Saratoga, you know, we recently greeted our water landscaping ordinance that we had in our city, you know, just to make it a little bit more conducive for us to save water. So we are doing little things here and there to address this problem that we have on hand. But at the end of the day, it's up to us in terms of what exactly do we adopt and uh, incorporate. But uh, I'll give you a quick example. You know, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to creating environmental consciousness, uh, there's a, a lake, Folsom Lake, uh, by the city of Folsom. And they released about 200,000 acreage feet of water that was released into the streams. That was not, uh, 
that was not uh, available as water supply. And why did they do that? Because they were following a 50-year-old manual that was written by the army cops that if the dam, if our, if our lake is hitting this particular cliff level, then you have to release the water, otherwise there is flooding. But based on recent forecast and indications, we are likely not going to exceed that. So why did we release 200,000 acreage feet of water uh, and uh, that's not going to be available as uh, drinking water? So those are the kind of challenges we have where we are not really adapting to the times. You know, that 50-year-old manual that was written by Army Corps engineers, we are still following that. It's all about collecting data. So now you have uh, assembly member Dodd, Bill Dodd. I don't know what district he's out of. Assembly member Bill Dodd, he's got a an open and transparent act related to water in terms of how we manage water and it's all about data. If you can collect data about water quality, about how we, how we have data available and accessible to our California citizens, you know, have it available online, then we can, we can sort of do a much better job of managing our water needs in California. You look at uh, Silicon Valley, it's a growing population here, you know. Saratoga has been curtailed. Yeah, our population has been over 30,000 for the last two or three decades. Cupertino has gone from 17,000 to 65,000. And there is a huge uproar right now. You know, you will see that play out now. You will all hear about it. It's not quite it's under the covers right now. But there's a ballot initiative to stop all that growth in, in Cupertino. And many other cities are kind of grappling with the problem because with growing population, you have only, only finite needs. Uh, available, uh, resources available, and then it's, it becomes a little bit of a struggle that goes on, right? So, so that's, that's the idea behind uh, the partnerships that we have. You know, we have the Master Gardener, uh, Santa Clara County here. You have the Santa Clara uh, Activist for Animals here. They are at the back there. They have many interesting flyers, so I really recommend you to please, uh, during the break, get a, get a plate of food. I think there's uh, plenty of, it's mainly snacks, you know, just to keep our energy going. And then there are some flyers at the back that uh, Lisa and team can provide you and they are there to answer any questions. And uh, when we think of the timing, we didn't expect the rain, but I didn't expect the selection Sunday to be on. You know? So I'm missing out on the selection Sunday, but I think I can, I'm TOing that. So when I go back, I'll find out what seed is my, the Yukon Huskies playing. But that's all I'm gonna say now. But uh, you know, this is basically a step in the right direction for us to orient ourselves in thinking in terms of how we can be a little bit more environmentally savvy. And my good neighbor here, Mir uh, Leva, you know, he has a lot of interesting ideas that he's always sharing with me. And uh, so we'll do a little Q&A at the end also. And would love to hear your perspectives, your ideas, in terms of how we can uh, help build that sustainable future. It all, it all starts local. Because when you look at the statewide, you know, that's a bigger challenge that we have to address. But if you have specific ideas here in terms of what could be done in Saratoga, you know, it's an opportunity. Our city is very willing to listen and make things happen. For example, dead trees. We had an ordinance, a tree ordinance, which is very strict. And for a dead tree, you actually have to go get a permit. And how do you get a permit? You have to go pay a fee at the counter, get a permit, go and cut the tree, cut dead tree down, and then you get a refund of the permit. And what we did was, we basically took that fee out. We said, if you have a dead tree, bring a picture to our desk, the, the city office. Our city arborist, Kate Bear, will look at the picture. And if it is truly a dead tree, we will give you a permit right on the spot and you don't have to pay any fee, right? So we are trying to make it easier and better and cheaper for our citizens to, to do business with the city. And so any ideas, thoughts that you have, we would be very much interested to hear about them. That's all I have to say. With that, I'm gonna turn it over back to Lisa, who's gonna introduce uh, our next presenter. I'm happy to introduce Arvind Kumar who served for six years on the board of the California Native Plant Society and is past president of its Santa Clara Valley chapter. He serves on the steering committee of the Going Native Garden Tour, which is now in its 14th year, and the Gardening with Natives subgroup. He has written for the Gardening Green column for the Loma Prieten, the newsletter of the local Sierra Club chapter, an engineer by training, a lazy gardener by choice, Arvant is an advocate for protecting native plants in the wild and for integrating them in the urban and suburban landscapes and our daily lives. He believes that the environment has helped one native plant at a time, one garden at a time. Welcome, Arvind. Thank you, Lisa. 
Thank you, Rishi, for inviting me here. And thank you all for showing up on a day like this. I thought we'd have maybe four people here counting me and my partner, and Rishi and his partner, and so on and so forth. So uh, thank you for the effort. To tell you the truth, if I was not speaking, I would have stayed home. So I really appreciate you coming out, and I will do my best to make it worth your while. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you, uh, start by talking to you about the problems facing California's environment. Then I'm going to cover issues of why native plants are so key, what, what role they play in a healthy environment. And finally, we're going to combine it all together and ask, what does it all mean for us homeowners, home gardeners? And in terms of how we do gardening, the gardening practices we employ, what can we do to help the environment, to conserve water, conserve natural resources, save money, save effort, and still have a nice looking garden? So let's start. Today's talk is mainly two parts. The first part is the problems with our environment. And it's a bit of a doom and gloom story. So if it gets too depressing, I ask you to bear with me until we get to the second part, which is all about solutions. What we can do, and, and there is, there's a lot we can do. And finally, I'm going to talk about some local resources you can tap into. Uh, let my talk just be an introduction. If I can pique your interest, there's a lot of resources available locally in Santa Clara Valley. In a nutshell, this is what I see as the major problems facing us in California. Number one, water scarcity. The drought of the last five years has made it painfully clear to all of us who live here, whether we've lived here a short time or a long time, that water is really a very, very scarce resource in California. And the way the populations in California have developed, it's not been with that reality in mind. We have built water systems and water districts and canals and dams and so on and so forth to supply water as if we live in New York, as if we live in the Midwest, or as if we live in Florida. But we live in California, and California is really its own continent. We'll talk a little bit about this. The second issue is growing energy demand. It seems that we human beings, no matter where we live, but especially in the United States, and especially in California, we're wedded to technology. And it seems any technology we use needs energy, needs electricity, needs gasoline. Um, we also live in a state of pollution. It's a real big problem. And I was not here 30 years ago, 40 years ago. But I'm told that pollution then was even worse than it is now. That's the reason why California is today a leader in environmental regulations and air quality is because our problem is much more serious than the rest of the country. And the good news is we are successful. We are successful in controlling pollution, but it's never ending that, that goal we have to meet every year. Um, and finally, from a biologist's perspective, you might have heard this, that California and the world in general is going through one of the largest mass extinctions in human history. We are losing plants, we are losing insects, we are losing birds, we are losing other mammals at a rate that's really unmatched by the historic record. And most of the causes of that decline in biodiversity is human causes. So let me begin by talking about water in California. And these pictures that I've selected, um, it's, with, uh, it's intentional. Uh, this is the image that I had in California when I first came here 37 years ago. It was a land of plentiful water, I thought. There was the Sierra Nevada, snow covered 12 months of the year, melting snows, rivers, streams. In my mind, California was not Nevada, it was not Utah. California was California, there was plenty of water. It's the largest agricultural industry in the world is located in California. How could we be short of water? Let's look at what the reality is. I'm showing you a map of the United States and how much rain or snow falls all over the continent. The bluer areas are areas of heavy precipitation. 
the yellow area is middling, and the brown areas is really dry. Let's look at some numbers. Boston gets 44 inches. Buffalo gets 39 inches. Columbus, 38. Raleigh, 43. And so on and so forth. You can see the East Coast gets lots of water, right? Moving to the midsection of the country, Minneapolis, 28 inches. Lincoln, 28 inches. Dallas, 29. Where I live in San Jose, it's 15 inches of rain a year. An average year. Where you live in Saratoga, it's a little more, but not much. 23 inches of rain. Compare that to the rest of the country. It is indeed a very, very dry part of the country that we live in. So when you're thinking about gardening, or growing things, landscaping, yellow gardening, etc., we have to keep this picture in mind. This is the distribution of rainfall in San Jose over the 12 months. Notice that saddle shape. Most of our rain comes during the winter time. And during five, maybe six, maybe seven months, there's hardly a drop of rain from the sky, right? This is the same distribution for Saratoga. Saratoga gets more water than San Jose, but the distribution is exactly the same, right? So any gardener that is not aware of this, is not taking this into account, is not really mentally living in California. Mentally, they're living in the Midwest, or East Coast, or whatever. If I made the same chart for Boston, you would see that the chart was more or less flat. In the winter, they got snow. In the summer, they got rain. But the average precipitation per month, over 12 months, is more or less constant. Not so in California. We talked about this. You know that rainfall in a desert is 10 inches or less. So San Jose is 5 inches more than the desert level. For seven months, there's little or no rain. This kind of climate is called a Mediterranean climate. Because apparently, the countries around the Mediterranean, that southern Europe and northern Africa, have a similar climate. An important thing to recognize about our kind of climate is that our plants go dormant in the summertime. When it's hot and dry, our native plants are adapted to deal with that long drought by reducing transpiration. They reduce the amount of water vapor that's evaporating through the deep pores. And they have different strategies for doing this. Some of them will drop leaves, some of them have tiny hairs, and so on and so forth. But they all shut down in the summertime. That's when our local newspapers and gardening columns are encouraging you to grow, grow, grow. That's because they're paying attention to the garden writers from New York, or worse, London. Most gardening books in Barnes & Noble are written by people who don't even live in the country. Okay, keep that in mind. Um, let's look at some more trends. This is a 50-year trend of annual rainfall in San Jose, where the average is 15 inches. And very recently, in 2013, we had less than 4 inches. According to scientists, the 2013 year was the driest in 400 years. So this is not a, this is not a small drought that we're talking about. Some more data regarding water in California. This is taken from an article in the Mercury News that came out, I think, a couple of years ago. This chart shows about 1,200 years on the x-axis at the lower part of the slide. And the line in the middle is average rainfall years. Okay. The blue areas are years of wetter than normal rainfall. And the red or brown areas are drier than normal rainfall. And you can see that right now we are entering a dry phase. We don't know how long it's going to last. But it may last as long as 200 years, because that's what the historical data tells us. I'm going to skip all these quotes. You can Google this on. Um, the Mercury News website. Here's another article from the Mercury News 
11 years ago. California's thirst for water will jump by 40% over the next 25 years, with much of the water going for landscaping. I've highlighted that, and I really want you to remember that. We're going to talk a lot more about this. Half of all the water used by England homeowners goes to irrigating yards. Half. For some people, it's more than half. We'll talk about this. When the construction industry builds new homes and has to get permits for construction and show where the water is going to come from, these are the numbers they use for planning new developments. An average use in a new home, about 17% of the water used goes towards the shower. And another 4% goes towards the toilets. About 9% to the kitchen, sink, and the laudatory faucets. 4% to the clothes dryer, clothes washer, sorry. Fully 57% of home water use, planning wise, is planned for the yard. And another 9% is allocated for owners over water. We'd rather be safe than sorry. We'd rather be sure we turn on the sprinkler longer than necessary. If you add up the landscape portion, it's 66%. So two-thirds of the water meant to be used in homes is planned to be used in your yards. Two-thirds. This is not insignificant, and nobody is really focusing on it. Low flush toilets and all those things are great for indoor use. But keep in mind that they only affect 33% of your total use. And of course, this water that's watering your lawn is clean drinking water, right? Prepared at pretty great expense. Some more facts about water in California. You may know this, but it's, it's good to be reminded. Water in California is imported from faraway places to support our cities and towns. California is mostly populated along the coast, San Francisco Bay Area, LA, San Diego area. There are really no sources of fresh water, large sources of fresh water on the coast to support these populations. This water comes to us from the Sierra. Transporting the water consumes a lot of energy. So from the Sierra, it's not all down here to the coast. There are pumping stations and storage tanks and canals and aqueducts and so on and so forth. It takes a lot of energy. By some estimates, something like two-thirds of the electricity consumption in the state is towards pumping water under that program. Something we don't always pay attention to, when the water comes out of the kitchen tap, let's say it's coming from Hetch Hetchy. What does that do to the environment in Hetch Hetchy? When we build a dam, build a large reservoir, it's great for us humans. But that water is not feeding, supporting salmon and other critters that depend on that flow. There's a, a, a mindset, a way of thinking that water running down the creek into the river into the ocean is wasted water. To a certain extent, you can make that argument. But if you do it to the last drop, you're actually taking away the sustenance the salmon need and the plants need and the birds need and so on and so forth. So, Every drop of water humans consume, we are denying it to other living organisms. Not to make you feel guilty, but there's a cost. So we need to remember that. And finally, the end user cost of water in California is still very low. Doesn't truly reflect the value of that water to us as a species. As an example, 50% of the water of the residents of San Joaquin Valley in the Central Valley have no water meter, so it's a flat rate. And so they can use as much as they want or as little as they want. It doesn't affect the bill. Sacramento. Parts of Sacramento. So laws have been passed, funding has been made available, they're installing meters, but it's a several years time. What where does that water go? Remember the 66%, right? What do we do with it? Most of us water alongs with it. Here's some data about lawns. There are 50 million homes in the country estimated to have lawns. If you add up the area of lawns in, in the country, it's 32 million. 
which is an area larger than the size of the state of Pennsylvania, which you know is not a small state. Grass clippings are the nation's largest irrigated crop. Not corn, not soybeans, not wheat. Grass clippings. To grow that grass the perfect shade of green, we use 70 million pounds of fertilizer, herbicides, fungicides, and pesticides annually. Right? And of course, 20 million leaf blowers. But more on that later on. Essentially, what we've got is we've got an industry that depends on you wanting that lawn to stay that perfect shade of green. So they want to sell you the chemicals, the tools, and the supplies, and of course, the mindset that a tiny dandelion growing in the middle of your lawn is like toxic, you have to get rid of the dandelion, right? Is that desire for ultimate control over nature is what the industry is trying to sell you. Um, what does this do to the environment, right? One lawnmower emits as much pollution in an hour as a car driven a thousand miles. Most of us don't think of that when we're pushing the lawnmower. And the reason for this is simply because the lawnmower's engine is not as heavily regulated as your automobile engine. The laws are written to control, you know, to regulate the cars, not these small horsepower engines. It's estimated that low horsepower machines account for 10% or more of the nation's smog. In Southern California, data collected quite some years ago now, maybe 20 years ago, was that these small gas-powered garden tools were emitting 110 tons of carbon monoxide, 14 tons of volatile organic compounds, and half a ton of nitrous oxide. It's all coming from not one single source, but hundreds and thousands and perhaps millions of gardeners like you and me, each one of us not individually responsible for this, but we're all adding to this total. It's estimated that 50, between 50 to 95 percent of fertilizers we apply in our lawns don't stay in our lawns. With the rains, they wash out of our lawns, go down the gutter, and down the drains, and end up in our creeks and rivers. It's also, uh, studies show that the major source of pesticides in our streams are home applications of products designed to kill insects and weeds in the lawn. 